Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, very glad to be here with 179 people who are as desperate and pathetic as I am, needing, as we all do, to be in a meeting at this time of day rather than doing something else. Uh, my date of sobriety is the 24th of July, 1993. My home group is uh, uh, so a group called Slow Learners, which we started a few months ago. Uh, we called it that because we're slow learners and faster forgetters. So we meet every week just to remind ourselves of what we are. And we practice the 12 steps, the 12 traditions and the 12 concepts. Uh, if anyone needs details of meetings or resources, my uh, a little uh, link of links is available as part of my name in the participants. So people can can grab the details there. Um, so I've been asked to speak on the question of the ABCs and step three. Now, veterans, of whom there are many here, I'm sure, will be very familiar with what the ABCs are. Uh, but there are going to be new people that aren't. And AA does have its ABCs. And they're on, if you want to follow along, uh, the laser display screen. It's in the big book <laughs> on page 60. Um, and... I like to put things in my own language. I'm not a particularly orthodox person in AA. Um, I put things in my own way. Uh, the ABCs are essentially this, that uh, I, I'm alcoholic and my life is a catastrophe because I'm an alcoholic. Uh, no one else can fix me, but God can and will if I seek God. Those are the ABCs, and then that places us in a position to be able to look at step three. But step three doesn't mean anything without those. So we've got really steps one and two in there. And step one when I first came to AA, and I first came to AA six months before I had my last drink, I was very impressed with the stories that people told, uh, dramatic and uh, tear-jerking by turns. But it is not dramatic and tear-jerking stories which tell me I'm an alcoholic. It's a, a couple of very simple and rather alarming facts. They're alarming once you realize what is going on. Um, the first fact is this. When I start to drink, I have no idea when I'm going to stop. Now, that idea is pretty well understood in AA, that people drink too much. If they're drinking at all on occasion, they drink too much. But there's a far more sinister sense to it. Um, my drinking got my attention very soon. It got my attention because I loved it. And it got my attention because it immediately started causing problems. I remember when I was 17 on a Saturday morning, having had a skin full the night before, being unable to perform at school to do the thing that I was supposed to do, knowing 100% it was alcohol. And thinking to myself about the activity in question, I guess I'll just have to give that up because I'm certainly not going to give drinking up. So alcohol got my attention and it got my attention so vividly that I would give up drinking for a few months. Sometimes people come to AA and say, well, I never tried to stop drinking. That's often not the case, by the way. You dig and you discover all sorts of attempts which have been blotted out. But I, I had a very successful attempt for a few months in the summer of 1991, if anyone remembers that. I don't know what was, I can't give you clues by telling you what was going on in the world in 1991, because I wasn't really, I was busy <laughs> with myself. Um, but in any case, what is true is that I gave up alcohol for a while. Uh, I gave up alcohol successfully. 
When I started again in the September, it was a year and a half before I managed to put together more than a day or two of sobriety. When I have a drink, uh, it could be years before it lets go. And I always say this because it's such a useful idea. Uh, I get this from my friend Tom, who says, alcoholism is a lot like dancing with a gorilla. You're not done dancing until the gorilla is done dancing. If I get back in the cage, anything could happen. That's the first problem. The second problem is the fact that part of my mind, the part of my mind which remembers what drink did to me, is quite disconnected from the part of my mind that remembers what drink did for me. These two parts of my mind do not talk. And so there are times I see people drunk. I work in an office, and when I leave the office to go home on a, particularly on a Thursday or a Friday, when I leave, I don't even know what day it is today. Is it Thursday? Whatever. There will be people outside a, a pub, dozens of them, and the thought of it is horrific. I never liked standing outside pubs, particularly when I was drinking. I just wanted to be drinking, and on my own was usually better. So most of the time I look at drink and it, the, the idea I'm either entirely neutral or I'm negatively disposed towards the idea of drinking. But occasionally I'll be in a situation where a drink looks beautiful. I was in a restaurant a couple of years ago and there was a bottle of Frasionette uh, or several bottles of Frasionette on the shelves behind the counter where the uh, maitre d was and when i was a kid uh, well when i was a kid things were a lot simpler milk was milk there was just milk there weren't different types of milk when i was drinking there weren't different types of frasionette there was just frasionette whereas now now there are all sorts of different types of frasionette i looked up i thought look at all those different types of frasionette i've never tried any of those what harm could they possibly do now i didn't want to drink but what was interesting about this was that I was only looking at one angle of the prospect of drinking, not the whole picture. And the nature of my alcoholism is this. It fragments my perception of reality so that I can only see one part of reality at a time. When I'm not very well, I can only see one part of reality at a time. And that's true with lots of sober things as well. I will only see the fragment of reality that relates to me and not other people's point of view. So I've got a mind which is fatally flawed. It doesn't matter how well I get and how coherent and logical and rational and reasonable I become in general. There is a hole in my bucket, as it were through which alcoholism will slip. Uh, and it doesn't matter if it's a Tiffany bucket with a hole in it. A bucket with a hole in it is no good. A mind with a hole in it is no good if you are an alcoholic and alcoholism can slip through the hole. To put it very, very simply, if I am in charge of my life, I will drink again one day. Very simple. Uh, there's a meeting, I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to, there's a meeting near where I live, where they say, this is, and this is, that each group is autonomous, so they're allowed to do what they do, it's fine. What they say is, we came for the drinking, and we stayed for the thinking, as if now we're sober, drink ceases to be a question. Now we're interested in something entirely different, as though they're two, first of all, as though they're two entirely different topics, but secondly, as though the trivial matter of alcoholism has now been satisfactorily uh, dispensed with. So now we can focus on our niggling resentments with people at work. Um, being obviously the main question of the day. And it's, it's not the case. Uh, now, I've never seen the Squid Game, but I saw, I think it was on Netflix and 
one of the wretched things about Netflix is that even if you don't want to catch the gist of a show, it will present you the preview so many times or just as far ahead as someone that's watched it. And I gather it's a sort of a limit. It was a, a, a Korean show where... Uh, for various reasons, people would be placed in this game show-like situation, except it was a game show to the death, with just one man or woman left standing. And those of you who have been around for 20 or 30 or 40 years, I, I'm coming up to 30 years this summer, will be familiar with this. If you look back at your first meeting of AA and say, well, how many of those people are still alive and still sober today? Now, some mercifully died sober after many years of happy sobriety. If you live in a big city, the chances are that lots of the people that you got sober with, uh, if you are still in the city, they're not. They're now living in New Hampshire. I think that's where they all go. Um, or Vermont or Maine. Uh, but the point is, they won't be around. They're sober, but somewhere else. But boy, are a lot dead or very unwell or in prison, or in mental institutions. Um, I fortunately went to the same group for many years in my first decade, and then for a few years in my second decade. So I got to see what happens over the very long term. It's not a scientific longitudinal study, but it's not far off. And... There were a few of us in the early 90s who were the eccentrics, who were always banging on about the steps and boring people to tears with our talk of step two and step seven and character defects and God and all of these other dreadful things. And we were thought oddities, but the oddities, when I look around, I run into the oddities, the other people who... Uh, uh, were very keen on the steps. And the majority of them were either Americans in London or people that are very well disposed towards Americans and hung out with them. Every single one of those who was very steppy and very gaudy is still sober. And there are very, very few people from that group who've made it all the way through the last 30 years who weren't the steppy people who uh, have stayed sober and stayed alive. Very many people died drunk. Very many people drank again after 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and were never seen again. So I came for the drinking, and I stay for the drinking. It's called Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's not a mistake. Uh, is my thinking sober relevant? I think it is. But it's relevant for this. To be safe from alcohol, I need to not be in charge of my life. I need not to be the owner of my life. I need to be the skivvy, the, the worker, the dinner lady, the janitor of my life. I have to do the menial stuff, and God looks after everything else. Now, for that to be the case, I need to have a clear head and a clear heart. My heart needs to be clear of other drives and passions. And if to the extent that they're still there, they're deactivated, they're not driving the bus. And I need to be able to think clearly to do good work. So thinking is relevant, but not so that I can have the life that I think I deserve, but so that I can serve God. And it's not a very comfortable message, this. Someone said that this might not be comfortable. Well, there we go. <laughs> uh, it's, if it, who said that help had to be comfortable? Um, heavens, I don't know about you. I put up with an awful lot of discomfort from my alcoholism in order to, to be able to get the benefit from it. So I'm perfectly capable of withstanding quite a lot of pain, quite a lot of incon... Drinking alcoholically is very inconvenient. People come to AA and complain that you know, going to meetings is inconvenient or doing step work is inconvenient. Not as inconvenient as drinking a bottle of gin a day. That is inconvenient. That will get in the way of a lot more plans than doing a 10-minute step 11 review and going to your little home group. 
Um, so those other things in life are relevant, but they're relevant because of the context of why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm doing what I'm doing because there is a power available which will take charge of my life in a very simple way. All the things that don't matter, which is everything outside my hula hoop, they may matter to others, but they mustn't matter to me. Everything outside the hula hoop is looked after by the higher power automatically. Everything that does matter, which is my conduct chiefly and my thinking too, my belief, but let's lead with conduct, will be guided by the higher power. So God says, almost everything I'm going to look after, you don't need to worry about that. The few things that do matter, I'll guide you. When I'm living like that, I don't drink. I could theorize as to why, but what's pertinent is the fact of it. I, as I say, came to AA and relapsed for uh, a number of months, in and out, in and out. That stopped when I grabbed hold of the program Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels. Uh, it shocked some sense into me. The fever went out of it, just like when a fever abates and you wake up in the morning after tossing and turning. And you feel grim as you feel like death. You feel worse than you did at the height of the delirious fever. But you know the fever has now passed. That's what it was like when I surrendered. It wasn't comfortable, but the fever had passed. And I'll tell you, this is not going to be entirely linear. It's going to be partly linear, but I'm giving you advance snippets of later bits of the program. I tell this story often, so if anyone's heard it before, I apologize. Uh, I found myself uh, in August or so, 1993, convinced that I was going to drink that night. And to cut a long story short, I won't give you the whole production number. To cut a long story short, I opened a Bible and it opened at the page of one of the Psalms where it says, be still and know that I'm God. And something from that line hit me, and I found myself able to go to sleep. My mind let go of me, and I was able to go to sleep without having a drink. And I woke up the next morning relieved, relieved that I hadn't drunk, but also quite literally sobered by the understanding that I need never drink again. That if I were to drink again, it would be because I would be deliberately throwing away the ever-present opportunity just to reach out to a power greater than myself. Uh, people ask the higher power to make things nice or to give them relief. Well, that's very nice. Um, good luck with that one. Uh, people ask the higher power to arrange their affairs. What I get from the higher power is to withstand, there's the ability to withstand pain and not act on emotion and impulse. Uh, I thought for a long time that what I had to do was ask God to take away the impulse, and that's not the case. What God does is gives me the strength to not act on the impulse. And that's a very different matter. Now, over the last 30 years, I have to say the impulse to drink has gone. The impulse to do other things is occasionally still there. But the program works, so I don't act on it. And I judge this by the results, not necessarily by the state of my mind at any particular point in time um, if you imagine a graph and towards the top of the graph there is a line a straight line going across like that and then below it is a as a, as a curve going like that like a wave with very steep peaks and troughs that line is my action 
the wave going up and down is my emotions and my thinking. Sometimes my emotions and my thinking are in line with my behavior. Sometimes they're not. I thought I had to sort my emotions and, and thinking out, and then the action would take care of itself. But it's the other way around, which means I have to learn to take action that I don't understand, I don't like, I actively disapprove of, I found thoroughly disagreeable, but I must take it anyway. Um, it always piques my interest when I'm corresponding with a sponsee by WhatsApp. Um, little messages are going back and forth, and I'll say something, and they'll say, I agree. <laughs> That's very nice. You think, what a lovely sponsee agreeing with me. Isn't that great? My sponsee agrees with me. But the question I send back, if I spot that, is what would happen if you didn't? Would that mean you wouldn't take the action I'm suggesting? Would that mean that the statement isn't true unless you agree with it? A spiritual teacher once said to me, you're Agreement is not a valuable contribution to the truth. The truth remains true whether you agree with it or not. You might have a more comfortable time if you happen to agree with it, but you can't change reality by your thinking. Uh, I can't change what right action is. If I agree with it, I'm going to be more comfortable when I take it, but it must not be a criterion for whether or not I take it. And this was the whole problem behind my relapsing in 1993. Because when I wanted to be sober, I found staying sober the easiest thing in the world. But as soon as I wanted to drink, I drank. Because I was still in charge. <coughs> you see... I'm one of those disconcerting sponsees. Maybe you've had them. They look like the best sponsee in the world doing everything you ask. Very currying favor, sycophantic, agreeing with everything, and then suddenly vanishing. I, I was in a meeting once, and <laughs> in the middle of sharing, someone stood up and said, I've had a massive realization. They walked out of the room. No one ever saw them again. We never found out what the massive realization was, but that was the end of them. <laughs> they were seen about 10 years later looking very shifty in another part of London. But this is the, this is the point. Um, I was a very, very good AA until the moment I was no longer interested in being a good AA. Then I went and drank again. I was still in charge. It looked like I was doing what I was told. I wasn't doing what I was told. I was doing what you suggested because I happened to agree with it. And that's very different. I think it was Clancy that talked about step three thus. He says, it's taking actions you don't believe in because the person who's suggesting them is doing better than you. Um, I came to AA not just kippered, jiggered by alcoholism. Uh, I was riddled with, well, these days in England, we say mental health. And what we mean by that is mental ill health. When you say, so well, someone's got mental health, it means they have mental health problems. The language has inverted itself. Uh, so uh, now I won't list all of the things that I did and thought, but they were, uh, they were a lot, when I was put in front of, I was plumped in front of professionals on a regular basis. And when I told them what was in my mind, they looked very, very concerned and the little pad started writing on their little pads. And they always made another appointment for me. I was very popular. I think I was I think I was part of a training module actually at the University Psychiatric Society. They all seemed to have a go with me. Um, so there was all of that going on. And my family is not exactly uh, well put together, God bless them. 
Um, so both my parents were institutionalized in mental illness. Um, two of my sisters uh, have been as well. My brother was an alcoholic who committed suicide. That's just the immediate family. You don't want to get into the cousins and the aunts and the uh, and the so ons and the so forths. But there's an awful lot wrong with me. Um, uh, I was also antisocial in the extreme. I mean, I'm not particularly social now, but I was very antisocial when I got sober. I'd never really worked. Uh, I was entitled, haughty, and loud mouthed. This was a terrible combination. There was an awful lot wrong with me. And my commitment to working the program was based on a very, very simple idea. How I've been living doesn't work. It doesn't work in relation to alcohol and it doesn't work in relation to anything else. Um, another of my favorite little stories is not much of a story. It's more of a line really. When I said to my sponsor, Doug, uh, I, I said, I'm very depressed. I'd learned the word, you see. I'm very depressed, so I would say it, depressed. And I was. He said, well, it's not so much that you're depressed, it's more that your life is depressing. If I had your life, I'd be depressed too. You don't have a job. You live in an S-hole. <laughs> you don't have any friends. <laughs> you're gloomy in the extreme. <laughs> You think very morbid things, most of which run true, all day long. You think of nothing but yourself. That's depressing. If you took a healthy person and parachuted them into your life, they'd be depressed within a couple of hours. I mean, the psychiatrists I used to speak to looked depressed when I was talking to them. They looked all right when I walked in the room. Ten minutes with me, great big long faces. Um, I'm making light of this because why not? I spent enough of my life being gloomy. And there's a solution. I discovered that my emotional and mental state was downstream of my behavior. My behavior was guiding everything. How I lived was conditioning how I felt. If I wanted to feel differently, I had to live differently and I had to think differently. And luckily, action can be taken. Sometimes people say, you give something to, to a sponsee to do, and they say, I'll try. And there is no try. Either one does it or one doesn't. I ask sponsees to do an, an, a nightly review and send it through to me. Most of them, I ask them to send it through to me. Some will say, I try to do it. No, no, you do it or you don't do it. I don't mind particularly if it's done badly. Uh, we can work on that, but it needs to be done before we can look at whether it's done well or not. You can have excuses or you can have results. You can't have both. So the position I got to in 1993 was that left to my own devices, I would drink. If I drank, I might never come back. And if I tried to, uh, if I was going to live sober, it had to be on an entirely new basis. I could not tolerate the thought that my life for the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, however many years, would be a sorry continuation of the misery of my teenage years before I ever drank. I had to be offered something better. And fortunately, uh, now I'm sure these long-faced professionals are very good and in their private lives are very cheerful and jolly, but you, you don't get to see any of that because it's, it's all very professional. The nice thing about AA is you get to see people in action. You get to see what they're really like before the meeting, during the meeting, after the meeting, at fellowship, on the phone. You get a full measure of what's available. And the measure I got was of people who were, now some people go for love 
And they said, well, I just know all addic- what, what do they say? You know, addiction is the opposite of connection or something like that. And, you know, we just need to be loved until we learn to love ourselves. And if that's, if that works for you, my hat is off to you. I'd been loved by people before I got to AA. Uh, I had to make a lot of amends to people. Um, and I've had to continue making amends to people. The reason I had to is because I treated them badly. The reason I was in a position to treat them badly was because they loved me. If they hadn't, they wouldn't have been in the room. A lot of people loved me before I got to AA. Lack of love was not the problem. Lack of validation was not the problem. Sure, there were some schmucks and jerks and whatever, but most people, frankly, in my childhood, treated me decently and courteously and kindly. I gathered together the egregious exceptions and stored them in my mind as the panoply of humanity, but they were a small minority. Most people treated me perfectly well. Yes, the people that treated me badly, I'm sure there was damage there, and that does attract the attention. But lack of good example, lack of good moral example, was not a, that was not the problem. Lack of love was not the problem. I was talking to a sponsee, actually, a few weeks ago about this very question. And uh, the, the fellow had written on, on, on his inventory, and I've seen this a hundred times, and I think I, I wrote it myself. Um, uh, I couldn't, you know, expect my parents to give more love than they had to give. Well, it sounds very spiritual, doesn't it? Very understanding. And the conversation went like this. Did you ever go hungry? Now, I know some people did go hungry and were were legitimately very ill-treated by their parents. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about most cases. In most cases, people were not starving when they were growing up. And people went out to work and provided for their children. Yes, they might have been grumpy and all sorts of other things. But my parents did an awful lot right, as well as doing a few things wrong. Lack of love, lack of attention, lack of care is not the problem. The example I had in the people around me in AA uh, and what attracted me was people who were, first of all, competent at living. And secondly, people who'd learned how to be untouched by their circumstances. And these were two very attractive qualities. The was I couldn't do anything. I could conjugate a few Latin verbs, but that was about all. Um, I didn't have any skills. And the people I saw around me had skills. They could work. They could have relationships. They could. They, some were married. Some had children. They had responsibilities. They did voluntary work for charities. They ran meetings. They did service, the AA service structure. I saw how they handled problems arising in the groups and this instinctive uh, spot-on response to situations that arose. I thought, I like that. Um, Very high levels of competence amongst some people, but also this... This unaffectedness, I remember being in a particularly grim meeting uh, around the autumn of 1993, very sorry, uh, a very sorry setup. And my, my then sponsor walked in, Doug, cheerful as anything, sat through the most morbid meeting and was just as cheerful at the end of it. I I was eight degrees more depressed by the end of that meeting than I had been at the beginning, but he wasn't. Maureen would talk about her husband, who was an alcoholic, who was still drinking. And when they were in the car and he started to have a go at her, uh, she would put on her headphones and listen to Alan on speaker tapes whilst he ranted. And when he stopped, she'd take the headphones off. (laughs) And she was just as far ahead perfectly happy. She she learned how to be in a world that was disagreeable to her without disagreeing with it. I liked this because I was affected by everything. I, I couldn't do normal things. I, someone very kindly, when I was about a month sober, 
um, someone invited me to uh, a dinner party at someone's house, very fancy. And I could, I knew I could scrub up for this. So I scrubbed up for it and showed up. And everything that people said uh, triggered so many insecurities in me. I was a basket case by about 11 o'clock. And when everyone left, it took a couple of people about two hours to talk me down from suicide. I couldn't be in a room with people in a successful way. You put me in a room with other people and I'd be suicidal within a couple of hours. This is not high fun. This is not a functioning alcoholic. This is a non-functioning human being. But there were people who learnt, who had learnt how to function, who'd been like I was, but who'd learnt how to function. Now, we've done the first part of the ABCs, the A, the B. They weren't going to fix me. They were going to show me what they did so that I would be fixed by the process. But I had to take responsibility. Um, they didn't reach into my grubby little flat and keep me company they said no we're at this meeting come to this meeting i went to where they were because that's where recovery was that god could and would if he was sought i'm not going to give a lecture on theology here but it's it's it thinks relevant to step three whatever mechanism and power is helping these people is this is very simple either that mechanism is available to me, or it's not. And I had a case of special and different when I got to AI. I was convinced that my case was radically different than other people's cases. And I remember at a, a little meeting in Hampstead um, and Rosslyn Hill in, I think, the spring of 1994, where... Uh, I trotted out some very dramatic story about lying down in the middle of the road trying to get myself killed so that I would die, but it, for it not to be suicide because I didn't want my parents to have a, yet another suicide in the family. I thought somehow if it were an accident, it would be better. Everyone go, oh, phew, well, at least it wasn't suicide, something like that. That was the thinking. And I shared it very dramatically, thinking I was somehow profiling myself in this way. I was indicating to people how special and tragic I was. Four other people shared almost identical stories, one after another in the same meeting. Um, I'm 99% cohort, 1% unique. There's nothing fundamentally different about me. Everything which I point to to say, well, I'm different. Well, I was mentally ill when I got sober. Well, join the club. Well, I'm, you know, I've got a form of autism. Well, so many other people in recovery. Uh, you, you, we can all make a list, frankly, if we want to. But the items on the list, the items on the list can be conveyed with language because the reason we have language for these things is because other people do them too. That's why we have a term for it. So there will be other people in AA who had the same problem. Whatever the problem is, someone else has had it and they've had it worse and gotten over it. Which is why, which is why I'm not frightened of anything because whatever is coming someone has dealt with one way or another so if this works for other people which it so clearly and obviously does why wouldn't it work for me all i have to do is take the action i don't have to like the action i just have to take the action i want to say something about step three for when you've been around for a while when you're new, step three can be relatively simple. Uh, the business of going to a gazillion meetings, doing your first set of steps, doing service at a couple of meetings, trying to hold down a job for the first time in years, maybe. That, that will keep you substantially busy. It's very clear what step three involves. 
after many years, it can be a different matter. And uh, what happened to me, and I've seen it happen to countless other people, is that AA worked, the steps worked. I learned how to work, for instance. I acquired one qualification and then another qualification and got a job and progressed very quickly in the job. I took on far too much responsibility, far too young. I could handle it practically, but not emotionally. I overstretched myself significantly. I got into a so-called relationship with someone. It was a very good relationship for eight years with someone else in, in, in AA. Um, it turns out that the real reason I wanted to get sober was that I wanted to get the goodies of life. I wanted to get the house and the mortgage and the pension and the friends and the fancy holidays and the dinner parties and the this and the that. I wanted to make up for some what I felt to be profound inadequacy within me. And I played the game that George Carlin describes as uh, trying to treat hunger by scotch taping sandwiches to your legs. I got very good at creating on the outside a perfectly reasonable life, which was not, it, it, and it wasn't even particularly self-centered in, in the fact of it being self-serving. I genuinely wanted in my career to do a good job for my employer. I genuinely wanted to be a good partner to my other half. But, but my identity, value, and purpose were all about my life. Life had the word my in front of it. So I wasn't wicked. I wasn't running around creating havoc. In fact, I was, I was something of a fixer. I was literally a fixer in my career of, uh, of, of dysfunctional situations. I would go into outfits and take the thing that was dysfunctional and sort them out and then go on to the next. I was not creating dysfunction. I was creating harmony. But I was doing it for me at the end of the day. Even though I was doing good, behind it, there was a plan which is to secure an identity for myself in the world. And then I would have somewhere safe and then they couldn't get me. I didn't know who they were. I still don't know. But there was a they. And if I can make myself secure enough practically in the world, I can't be gotten. Needless to say, things outside of my control mattered to me. My bank balance mattered. My job security mattered. The fate of the firms that I worked for mattered to me. Other people's opinion of me, my opinion of myself, all mattered. And I was full of anxiety. Waking up at four o'clock in the morning. Uh, with panic attacks, unable to go into the office Sunday. And I wasn't medicated in any way. So I was feeling everything at point blank range with no silencer. What step three says on page 61, and, and, and you'll miss this if you blink, so don't blink. Um, is he not a victim of the delusion that he can wrest happiness and satisfaction from this world if he only manages well? I was living on the basis that if I live a good life, I will be happy and I will do anything. I was very hardworking. I was very diligent. But the equation doesn't work. Because as soon as my happiness, my identity, my value, my purpose are based on things which are affected by anything outside my control, I'm going to be very frustrated a lot of the time. I'm going to be full of fear. And you know what? When you get your own way, you're happy for about five minutes. I remember when I was uh, in my mid-twenties, 
I was qualifying in, in, the, in my profession and uh, I won something, doesn't matter what, I won something. I've been working for it for years and I was thrilled. My name was in the paper and I was good for a day or two, thrilled for a day or two. Then I thought I've lost three years for this day. Fool's game. What step three says is F that for a game of soldiers. Don't play the fool's game. There is a different way of living. And no one is asking me to give up my occupation or my home or my relationship or my whatever. No one is saying that I have, that, that it isn't strictly vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Obedience, maybe. But it's to say that all of these things and my very life itself are not mine anymore. They no longer have the word my in front of them. We made a decision in step three to turn our wills and our lives over to the care of God. Which means they're not mine anymore. They are God's. And what I'm given back, I'm given back, I'm awake for around 16, 17 hours a day. I'm given 17 hours a day to spend wisely. I think of the 17 hours as 17 one-hour vouchers, which I'm to redeem for right action. My job is to redeem the day. My identity must not be grounded in the world. It must be grounded in being a child of God, which means my fundamental nature is consciousness. I cannot be harmed. My consciousness is upstream of everything. So nothing downstream can affect what is upstream of the river. My consciousness is who I am. What happens down there, none of my business. Uh, my value is infinite because I exist. If you doubt that, if you live in London, get up very early and go and find a fox and look in its eyes and tell me that existence isn't infinitely valuable. If true for a fox, how much more for a person? Uh, and my purpose, I don't know, but I don't need to know. This is where the trust comes in. I don't get to quantify the value of anything that I do. There was a moment in 1993 where I said to uh, Maureen um, that I wasn't going to be able to do a step four because I could communicate and I could communicate effectively only through the medium of poetry. Remember what I said earlier about being haughty and, and impossible? Uh, and she said, you're a common or garden alcoholic. Now, for her, that was an offhand comment. For me, it changed the course of my recovery. I think that was one of the pivot points where my direction changed. It changed the course of my life. And hopefully my life has affected a few people in a beneficial way in the last 30 years. Who can judge the value of that single comment if it hadn't been made, if that moment had been mishandled? I don't know what would have happened. So I can't judge the, the, the purpose of anything I say. My job is to ask God what to do and do it. And then what becomes of anything I do, that now belongs to the world. And um, I died when I took step three. I gave up. I said, that's my life over. Anything that I get back, any 17-hour block of time, that I get given to, to do as my higher power would have me do is a bonus. Um, and I was very ill when I was uh, eight years sober and I, I asked the doctor at the time, am I going to get through this? It was unrelated to my alcoholism. And the doctor said, we don't know, just have to wait and see. Either your body will clear this infection or it won't. If it doesn't, well, there we go. British bedside manner. Um, she, she knew her customer. Right? 
Uh, and it was then that I understood that the whole thing, the whole of my life since taking step three had been a bonus. We're in extra time already. If you're familiar with, I think it's in football, they have extra time at the end uh, to make up for time, which is stopped for various reasons. When I was gotten sober by a higher power through AA, the match was already over. I'm in extra time. So there's nothing to worry about. It doesn't matter how long that extra time is. It might be a few days, might be a few years. Unpredictable. But it doesn't matter. Because the other thing which is true, I'll finish on this point. When I get to a point, there is no one who I have unfinished business with. When I first got to that point, I thought, I'm no longer frightened of dying. Because this is the only realm in which I can finish the unfinished business of this realm. The fear of death was the fear of having to leave this realm with unfinished business. That was the only reason it turned out. Um, I'm well aware that people's lives extend beyond what's referred to as the grave. I have no doubt about that for lots of different reasons. I've had lots of experiences. So I'm not frightened of death. And I know I will be together with who I'm meant to be with after my so-called death. As Anne Lamott says, it's a fairly major change of address, but nothing more than that. So if you're new, just get on with the steps, do as you're told. If you're around a bit longer, maybe consider the value that is being given to the material world. Uh, that's all I've got. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.